Bush. Coming up after the next song, I'll be speaking with Junie Morosi. Now, the Cairns Morosi affair in 1974 it was known. It was then known as the Cairns Morosi affair. It was Australia's most infamous political sex scandal. But beyond the spectacle and hoopla, it was a love story. And Jim and Junie's visionary work on the origins of violence was something that uh, we'll, I'll meant to touch on in the interview with Junie. They also were the first, they, they organised the first ever CONFEST. CONFEST is still going today, and the first one was in a picnic area outside Canberra, so we touch on that as well. Juni Morosi, it's a great pleasure to have you on Bay FM. Thanks for joining me in the Inspiration Lounge. Thank you for having me, Andy. It sounds like fun. Junie, in 1974 you were splashed across the headlines. What was your experience? Perhaps I could start with the fact that um, I was, uh, I had a, had a 20 year career in the airline industry and was the first female uh, manager or executive in that industry in Australia. Um, at about that time, um, Lionel Murphy, who was senator and um, leader of the opposition in the parliament, offered me a position uh, in the new community uh, relations department that he was um, uh, forming, and so which I accepted, and I came to Canberra. Three months into being in Canberra, I got offered a position with Jim Cairns, who was then Deputy Prime Minister and Treasurer uh, of Australia, which I accepted. The position he offered me was um, to assist him with research into the development of a um, project into finding out what the origins of violence and love were in order to uh, try to facilitate a more compassionate society. What an amazing and inspiring role to have. Oh, it was, it was so exciting. I couldn't, I couldn't resist it. I mean, uh, I had to take a cut in salary to go and work for him. However, as it turned out, um, it wasn't a, I was not a very popular uh, choice for him, and it created a scandal um, that took epic proportions. Now, Jill, your publicist, blurb that I read on air a minute ago said that you were a hot Asian chick. Now, there's certainly room for spice in this particular context. Is that one of the reasons that your selection for the position was not popular? Yes, I would say that the reason was ma several. One, there had never been a, um, a female in the position of principal private secretary in the parliament, so I'm Asian and there are no other Asians in parliament either. What so, country are you from originally, Jeannie? I was born in China, but I'm Eurasian. And so my, my father was Italian-French, my mother Portuguese-Chinese. And so where to from there? Obviously there was a, a romance blossomed, it hit the headline. I think the words you used earlier uh, would have been how a lot of Australians would have perceived me. Uh, however, I perceived myself to be highly professional in whatever I was doing. <laughs> and and uh, it was... Uh, uh, pretty difficult when you know when Jim said that if I had been short fat and ugly and wore glasses there would have been no scandal at all so I guess um, it is pretty shocking to people to see me in Parliament and what was the outcome after all that blew over and you continued your life there was a, a range of things that you did you, you started the first ever confest with yes. Jim Tell us a bit more about the journey from there. Well, it really had a lot to do with Jim Cairns because, um, as you probably know historically, it was a very short government. The Whitlam government was, I think, the last visionary government we had, and Jim did what didn't stay very long. He resigned from Parliament in '76, and we went on to study um, community uh, activities. He'd been Minister for Environment, so we had a lot of community connections. and. Um, we started the confest uh, things which go on still until today, which was a combination of conference and festival. And we had the first one at the Cotter, and we thought we'd get a few hundred people. 16,000 people came. Now, moving along to the present day, you're 77 years old. What's happening today for you? Well, <laughs> strange enough, I'm doing exactly the same thing, except that I now run a community 
which has been here for 25 years, along with the Cotter, and soon after that we formed a community in Canberra. We've been involved in personal growth uh, workshops, conflict resolution, um, uh, even channeled entities, and, you know, every part. Uh, I've been studying every aspect of the alternative. How interesting. Just like I think many people who listen to Bay FM would be fascinated. Exactly, now, and many, many of those people, I think, are people who were fugitives from the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk after a break about the next top author competition and we'll talk about your third book. Thank you. You're in the, ins you're in the Inspiration Lounge. Just to clarify, after this song we'll go into a little bit about the next top author competition. I want to clarify the website. It is www.nexttopauthor.com. Listening to the Inspiration Lounge, I'm Andy Travis and with me on the phone from Canberra is Junie Morosi. Junie, it's a pleasure to have you with us. It's a pleasure to be here. It's really fun too. Oh, I'm having fun as well. Now, you've written three books. The first one was called Sex, Prejudice and Politics and I wrote it in 1975 and it was about the events of the time. Uh, the second one is called Tomorrow's Child. By then I had Galleon who was then four years old and I felt that bringing him up in the new paradigm that I espoused and had emerged out of my research uh, would be interesting. So I tell the story of our lives till he's the age of four, perhaps, uh, five. And um, the third book is one I'm working on and has been a source of <laughs> uh, great angst for me, actually, because I've actually written this book twice and this is the third time. I was not satisfied with uh, and my previous work, and so uh, the opportunity came to um, uh, have a conversational uh, treatment with my friend Jill, who is a journalist and has been my friend for about 30 years now. And we were invited to uh, join something called the next spiritual author dot com, which is a website that's running a competition which relies heavily on votes. And so I'm here talking about that. Now I just want to clarify, uh, if someone wants to go to that website, is it nexttopauthor.com? Yes, that's right. Yep. And, and then enter our name, M-O-R-O-S-I. Tell us a little bit more about what's in the book. Well, actually it's, um, I suppose, the story of my life in stages and coming out in, uh, one would imagine, conversations with a friend over a cup of tea. It sounds very personal. It sounds very intimate. Yes. That's how I, I'd like it to be. Is there a way that people can get a taste of the book online at the moment? Yes, certainly. If they go on to nexttoauthor.com and put in the my name, we have a submission, both Jill and I, on video. Oh, perfect. And um, we would love for people to watch it and if they feel it worthy, to vote for it. We'll come back to you and talk a bit about the origins of violence and love. Fantastic. You're in the Inspiration Lounge, and with me on the phone from Canberra is Junie Morosi, who made headlines in 1974 for her love affair with Jim Cairns. Junie, we've covered a lot in this interview so far, and one thing that stood out, you mentioned the topic of your second book. Generally, you looked at a new way of raising children, and that forming a basis for a conscious community. Can you tell us more? Yes, certainly. I think that Jim and I actually in were involved in... 13 years of research into the origins of violence and love. And at the end of that, we realized that it went back to the child. And there was worldwide research to back that up as well. There's someone called James Prescott who did some excellent experiments on monkeys and, and uh, primates. So I felt, as I found myself pregnant then, my husband, my then husband, David Ditchburn, and I decided we'd wanted a child, so I became pregnant, and I thought, what a wonderful opportunity to implement these things, research points, <laughs> and so on, and we did. Can I interrupt there? So the, uh, the research was done with Jim Cairns, but yep. the father of your child was... David uh, Ditchburn. I see. Go on. Um, Jim and I had a, a relationship that was based on a common passion, and that was, as I said to you, the... Uh, evolution of our society into a more enabling and compassionate society. Um, David and I decided to have a child at this time and, and we'd been trying for some years actually and uh, it happened. 
so it was just ready made for me and so I thought fantastic way we started uh, my child needed a, uh, an extended family I grew up in an extended family so I knew what community was and um, so uh, we formed a community and we had uh, a great um, uh, situation here in Canberra where we had uh, 30 35 people and uh, half of which are children <laughs> and it was a wonderful time now the book did it succeed? Did it become well known? Well, I don't. Um, I don't think. I don't think as well known as I would have liked it. <laughs> <laughs> it was all right. I think we we sold about ten thousand copies. One of the things I'd like to ask is if you could sum up what you learnt in that uh, child rearing experience and in writing the book. You mentioned off air the power of love when it's a feeling and when it is expressed through touch as opposed to something you just think. Could you share a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I found that, I found that it was quite shocking to me to realize that most of us think love more than feel it. Um, I, I realized that, you know, it was possible for someone to say that uh, this is for your own good. My father, for example, and beat me up. Yeah, it sounds uh, terrible, but I, I'm I can doing this because I love you. There's kind of a warped logic there, isn't there? <laughs> Incredibly so, but generally accepted. You know, spo uh, spare the child, uh, spare the rod and spoil the child, isn't it? Uh, and I've heard the term, uh, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you, which is, That's yeah, right. it's just pretty warped. Well, it suddenly, that suddenly became conscious to me. <laughs> I had sort of just accepted that as varying views, but then I realized that that was the, the basic paradigm. And what's the new paradigm? Well, it's, I think best uh, uh, example would be to the Iquana Indians, for example, in, in uh, South America, where the child is totally indulged in every way except to with the motivation for him to understand, for him or her to understand the consequences of their action. For example, you don't say, don't touch the fire. You bring the child close to the fire and let him feel it and say that that hurts. I see. In other words, it's nature's way of teaching rather than our intellectual development uh, uh, teaching. I'm cutting myself off from asking more questions because we've run out of time. Right. I would like to invite you to join me on the Inspiration Lounge about this topic. I'll be delighted I, to do so, Andy. On behalf of the staff and the people that subscribe and listen to Bay FM, I want to say congratulations for a, a life well lived and thank you so much for sharing some sections of it this morning with us. Thank you so much, Andy. It's been a, a great journey and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you.